Now we're going to take an in-depth look at one specific case in order to illustrate many of the concepts we've been talking about over the last several lectures. This case is Patterson v. McLean Credit Union, and it's not a famous case. It's not a particularly significant case, and it's a little different from most of the cases people talk about in that it's a case that involves statutory interpretation, not constitutional interpretation, but it was a very interesting case in the way that it unfolded, and so let's go ahead and uh, take a look. So, first of all, let's talk about how this case got started. What were the allegations? This is a case involving allegations of racial discrimination in employment. Brenda Patterson was an African-American woman, and she was an employee of McLean Credit Union based in Virginia. And she claimed that she was the victim of racial harassment as an employee. She was the only black woman who worked for the company, and among her allegations, she claimed that she'd received a lack of support, that she'd been passed over for several promotions, and then, uh, despite receiving good reviews, she had been fired after 10 years. Now, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is, in this case, the Supreme Court was acting as an appellate court, so it wasn't interested in the facts. This case is not about whether Brenda Patterson was actually harassed by McLean Credit Union. The issues in this case merely had to do with whether or not she was even entitled to bring a lawsuit to try to prove her case. So the issues are not about the facts, but about whether or not she even has a chance to try to prove her facts. So of course, Brenda Patterson, well, the place where you try to prove your facts is in court, and so she wanted to file a lawsuit, as anybody in this situation would if they were indeed the victim of racial harassment. Now, today, most lawsuits that are filed involving racial discrimination and employment are filed under a particular law, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and in particular, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VII specifically bans racial discrimination in employment. So most people who experience racial discrimination in employment sue using Title VII. But for Brenda Patterson, Title VII had two distinct disadvantages. One, she claimed that she'd been a victim of discrimination for more than 10 years, and yet Title VII limited the damages she could receive to $250,000, which she didn't feel was enough and might not get her adequate legal representation. In addition, uh, and this is obscure and you don't really need to know about this, but the law called for a bench trial that is a trial by a judge, not a trial by a jury, and uh, Brenda Patterson, for various strategic reasons, preferred a trial by a jury. So Brenda Patterson did not really want to use Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, so she was looking for another law that she could use, and her attorneys settled upon the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Now notice, this is a very old law, but it's still on the books. It was a law that was passed immediately following the Civil War, and the Civil Rights Act of 1866 prohibits racial discrimination in the making and enforcement of contracts. Now you're going to want to remember that phrase because that's going to be a very important phrase as we go forward. In the making and enforcement of contracts. Brenda Patterson argued that McLean Credit Union violated the Civil Rights Act of 1866 because her employment was a form of a contract because it was a legally binding agreement and that that employment contract was made in a discriminatory manner, therefore violating the Civil Rights Act of 1866. But this was unusual because this law was not normally used in this way and racial discrimination in employment cases were not usually brought using this law. Now, in order to understand what happens going forward, we must look to the past, as the Supreme Court always does. When the Supreme Court hands down decisions, of course, it looks to similar cases that it's decided in the past, and it uses those cases going forward, unless, of course, it decides to overrule those cases. 
And in the case of Brenda Patterson, there's one particular precedent that was extremely important. That was a case the Supreme Court decided in 1976 known as Runyon v. McCreary. Runyon v. McCreary is important because it involved the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Remember, this is the law that Brenda Patterson wanted to use to bring her lawsuit to court. And so Runyon v. McCreary had something to say about the meaning of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and so it became important to Brenda Patterson. In Runyon v. McCreary, the issue was a simple one. The question was whether the Civil Rights Act of 1866 applied to only governmental discrimination, which is also known as public discrimination, or does it also apply to private discrimination, non-governmental discrimination? In Runyon v. McCreary, everybody agreed that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 prohibited racial discrimination by the government. So the government could not adopt laws or practices that discriminate on the basis of race. The question, though, that was unclear until Runyon was decided was whether the Civil Rights Act of 1866 also applied to private entities such as businesses like McLean Credit Union. McLean Credit Union is a private business, it's not part of government. And so the question in Runyon v. McCreary is if the Civil Rights Act of 1866 applied to entities like McLean Credit Union. In a 7-2 decision, the court decided that it did, that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 applied to private discrimination as well as public discrimination. Now, although this case was decided long before Brenda Patterson decided to bring her lawsuit, it was very, very important to her because if the Supreme Court had decided the other way, if the Supreme Court had decided that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 only applied to public discrimination, then Brenda Patterson would not have been able to bring her lawsuit because, again, McLean Credit Union is a private entity, not a public entity, and as a result, uh, if McRunyon v. McCreary had, had gone away, the court would have had no jurisdiction over the case. But since the court decided that it did apply to private discrimination, Brenda Patterson was eligible to bring her case against McLean Credit Union. I want to make sure you understand those concepts before we move on. If you don't, you can go back and review it or send me an email for clarification. Now, one very important thing to note is this was a 7-2 decision, but William Rehnquist, who at that time was just an associate justice, dissented. He was a conservative and he argued that the Civil Rights Act should only apply to public discrimination. This is not surprising. Conservatives typically oppose civil rights legislation and they typically vote to limit their scope. Liberals, on the other hand, tend to support civil rights legislation and tend to broaden their scope. And so this was a liberal decision with William Rehnquist in dissent. So, Brenda Patterson was allowed or was permitted to bring her lawsuit because the court had previously said that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 does allow lawsuits against private entities like McLean Credit Union. So Brenda Patterson filed her case in the United States District Court. But the U.S. District Court threw out her lawsuit because they said, yes, although it's true that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 applies to private businesses, it doesn't apply to Brenda Patterson's case because this didn't involve the making and enforcement of contracts. They argued, the U.S. District Court said that this was a simple, straightforward employment discrimination case. It did not involve the making and enforcement of contracts, and therefore they threw it out. Now please note that I mentioned earlier that this is a case of statutory interpretation. And the reason for that, of course, is because the courts are having to interpret this phrase. What is the making and enforcement of a contract? That is a phrase in a statute that was passed by Congress. It's not a part of any of the Constitution. But the question is, what did Congress mean when they wrote 
making an enforcement of contracts and did they intend to include employment discrimination? The U.S. District Court ruled that they did not. Brenda Patterson then appealed her case to the U.S. Court of Appeals and the U.S. Court of Appeals affirmed the District Court's decision, meaning that they upheld that decision. And so then Brenda Patterson, of course, only had one place to go, so she appealed her case to the United States Supreme Court. Now, the court, of course, granted certiorari, otherwise we wouldn't even be talking about it. So now let's take a look at who was on the court at the time, and as has been true for much of the last 25 to 30 years, the court was closely divided. At the time, there were four justices on the court who were clearly conservative. One of them was William Rehnquist, who, since Runyon v. McCreary, had been promoted to the Chief Justice of the United States. Another conservative, Justice Antonin Scalia, Scalia excuse me, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, and Justice Byron White. So you had four conservatives who were likely to rule against Brenda Patterson. They were balanced by four liberals who were likely to vote for Brenda Patterson. William Brennan, who had been on the court for a very long time and was considered a real liberal hero. Thurgood Marshall, who we've talked about previously in the court. Harry Blackman, who of course we've spoken of and John Paul Stevens. So the court was fairly well divided. And there was one wild card though, the newbie. Anthony Kennedy had just joined the court. In fact, he had been on the court less than a week when, it was the very first week on the court when the court heard oral argument in Brenda Patterson's case. And so obviously he had been appointed by a Republican president Ronald Reagan, everybody expected him to be conservative, but he cast no votes, and his uh, behavior, what he would do, was completely unknown, and he was the wild card. And so as we go forward, uh, we'll want to pay attention because Anthony Kennedy is going to play a key role in how this, uh, this case unfolds. So, uh, 